guest tonight is a distinguished Islamic scholar. He's a student of Indian nationalism, but above all, he's become an icon and example of secular courage. He's a professor of modern history and the officiating vice chancellor at Jamia Millia Islamia. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Mushirul Hassan. Uh, Dr. Hassan, sort of despite uh, 50 years of uh, independence uh, and, and uh, our attempts at creating a, a secular ethos uh, why is, is sort of sectarianism and, and uh, still sort of flourishing and asserting itself uh, in, in, in a manner at, at this time? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult question to answer because it has... Uh, it is a rather complicated story, but, but in some, I think, basically the secular agenda that was adopted in 1947 has really not been pushed in the way that it should have been. And although we set ourselves the ideal of a secular society, uh, the process for the secularization of the society was never really initiated in any meaningful way or in any tangible form. Uh, so that when there was a political crisis at the center, uh, there was enough space, as it were, in Indian polity for non-secular forces to assert themselves, which is why we experienced what we did uh, in the late 80s, uh, culminating into the demolition of the Babri Masjid. Would you sort of uh, help us understand or describe what this, this secular agenda was at the time of independence? What well, I developments? think basically the secular agenda uh, in 1947 was defined by the, uh, by the uh, character of our nationalist movement, in which the, uh, the central argument all around, uh, despite the presence of communalism and in the 1930s, the rise of the Muslim League and the assertion of the Hindu Mahasabha and the RSS, but it was very clear to the nationalist leaders of this country, particularly those in the Congress, and I obviously have in mind Gandhi, Nehru, Bose, and C.R. Das, and a whole lot of others, who believed in a composite society, who were committed to the creation of a modern nation in which religion would have its due place, but it would not be a factor which would divide people, who thought in terms of a socialist or an egalitarian society. So in, in some sense, the terms uh, of what was to follow after independence were defined by the character of the nationalist movement which really appeals to people on, this fa on the basis of the fact that they're part of a nation, that their problems were the same, and their experiences, both historical and contemporary, were much similar. And that is what the Constitution had, uh, what, what that is what the Constitution mirrors. Now, I think Nehru, uh, notwithstanding what, uh, what, uh, what people say now, Nehru defined that agenda in much more coherent terms. Uh, and, uh, and the terms, in a sense, reflected his own personal commitment to a secular society. It also mirrored the aspirations of the nationalist leaders before 1947. In, 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 in what ways were, were the elements of this enshrined in the formal structures and articulation of the Constitution? Well, I mean, in terms of the fact that the minorities were, uh, were gu guaranteed certain fundamental rights, along with others, uh, that they had, uh, they had the right to worship, to propagate, and to, uh, to hold on, to perform their rituals, and so on. And mind you, I think the important thing to remember is, and we tend to underestimate this fact, that all this was being done against the background of a bloody partition. Uh, and I think it goes to the credit of those people in 1947 that they were not swayed by the if you, if you like, religio-fundamentalist rhetoric on both sides of the border, and, and, and said that, look, this has happened, but this is going to be disastrous if India was to be declared as a Hindu state or, or, or a non-secular state. It's not going to be good for the country, because after all, there's still 45 million Muslims who, for whatever reason, decided to stay back in Pakistan, um, back in India.
So it was a very significant, uh, uh, and this decision is really reflected in many constitutional provisions. And I think, by and large, Indian society did adhere to those, to those principles, though, as I said, uh, that it was not pushed in the manner that it should have been. When you say sort of pushed by the manner it, it, it should have been, uh, do you think the impetus should, for this uh, might have come from, from government, from, from intellectuals, course. the community? I, I mean, I, I'm firmly of the opinion uh, that, that in third world societies, uh, the state does act as a major catalyst. Uh, if you look at the wide, array, a wide you know, a number of areas, such as social reforms, now, a legislation initiated by a government does, over a period of time, acquire considerable legitimacy. Therefore, state-sponsored secularism, uh, and here I, I, I do agree with a lot, I disagree with a lot of fellow social scientists, that state-sponsored secularism also has its place in the creation uh, of a secular society or in the articulation of of a secular identity. And that happened to some extent during Nehru's tenure. Uh, but then he also had to, uh, to make concessions to religious susceptibilities. He also had to make compromises. Uh, and so that the agenda was not, was not pressed as hard as it should have, should have been done. When you talk about sort of policies and initi initiatives, uh, what, if, if you were sort of seeking or asked to sort of advise the government or the state, uh, and, and say that what are some of the kind of initiatives or policy shifts, uh, concretely and tangibly, that you would recommend? What might these? Well, be? I would, as a as a student of history and as a social scientist, one of the areas that interests me greatly is the is the is the poor quality of uh, of the textbooks that are prescribed in in our in our schools across the board, and. Uh, yeah, and if you were to look at these textbooks, particularly uh, history textbooks, you would be appalled. I mean, not only are they very poorly written, but their content, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's sure to heighten communal tendencies. It's certain to create prejudices towards one community or the other. And I think that is a, an area in which there has been a lot of discussion and a lot of committees have been set up but unfortunately, nothing tangible has, has emerged. I think the state also has to define its position in relation to religious processions, which have been a cause of, of much dispute and has led to communal riots in many parts of the country. You have to decide whether public processions, religious processions, are in the interest of communal harmony or not. I'm not saying that you do this or you do that, but certainly you have to you have to evolve a policy. I think the state has to really look at the functioning of minority institutions and see you know, the, the sort of role that they are performing, uh, monitor their activities, and not just be content with you know, doling out a few crores of rupees and then forgetting about it, and allow them to, as it were, stew in their own juice. You know, there are concrete areas where state intervention is extremely critical. And I think that has not been, you know, something which, uh, which has been looked into very carefully. How serious do you think uh, the problem of, uh, of, of looking at, at the history books is? It is, in a sense, a form of uh, a cultural imperialism, and it's because much of that history is, is, is still written and derived from Western colonial sources. Yeah. Uh, that's sort of one part of, part of my question. But, but along with that is, 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 is also the concern that... Uh, that there seems to be a proclivity to rewrite history now, mm -hmm. and you know whether it's sort of changing the names of cities or in yeah. interpreting history yeah. for your own sort of political ideology. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. As, as a historian, uh, how do you come to terms with these sort of? Well, I don't, you know, I don't particularly mind, <laughs> uh, you know, changing the names of various cities. I mean, so long as such moves are not, are not initiated by any parochial considerations. But I certainly do believe that, that in the light of our own contemporary experiences and as a result of the availability of new sources, it is quite possible to reflect on our history somewhat differently. And a new nation has to really rewrite uh, many aspects of its own history because 
because of the weight of, of, of colonialism, uh, because of the impact of colonial writings, thinkings have been more or less molded or stereotyped, whatever. So it is extremely necessary to look at some of those themes differently, to explore many other facets of our society which has not been done. So I think this exercise is a very useful one. Uh, and at the end of the day, you may have a very clear picture uh, of some of the issues which concern even our contemporary society. But the fact of the matter is that as far as historical writing is concerned, we in medieval India, we seem to have reached a dead end. Because having exhausted the theme of nationalism uh, and uh, to some extent uh, colonialism, I think we have not really been able to identify uh, new grand magisterial themes uh, that will generate a degree of interest in our universities. Dr. Hassan, in, in sort of general lay terms, uh, how would you sort of uh, recommend, shall I say, uh, nationalism to, 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 to people in India? It's the 50th anniversary of, of India's Indian independence. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think the, the, the idea of nationalism is being used and abused. Yeah. Uh, how would you sort of define and place this in perspective? Well, I would, I would represent uh, nationalism, the nationalist movement uh, as, as, as an epic struggle. Uh, it, it, was, it was epic because, because of the scale and depth of popular participation in it. Uh, and it was also you know, unique in so many ways because I don't think that except in the case of China, uh, where of course there was one party, one individual who guided uh, the movement against imperialism. But the unique thing about the Indian nationalist movement was that it was able to bring disparate groups and, and able to sustain their struggle against British colonialism. The other unique thing about the Indian nationalist movement, as indeed about Indian nationalism, was that it was able to articulate the aspirations of large numbers of people and yet stay together and stayed together not just you know, in 1947 or until 1947, but even after many, many years. I mean, after all, that is the, that is the genius, if you like, uh, of the Indian National Congress, which unfortunately uh, it has lost, or maybe fortunately, I don't know. But, but that is the singularly most important factor, that Indian nationalism represents an ideology which, which transcended a narrow parochial, sectarian, or linguistic or regional considerations, that it was able to unite and unite for a very long time large numbers of people in a, in a, in a momentous struggle, that it was able to enunciate policies and programs that did not necessarily reflect the interests of a particular segment, which is really what, which is what happened in the in and if you look at Indonesia or if you look at Egypt, I mean, these movements degenerated and, and the people who led these movements became cult figures, unlike India. Because, you know, of the quality of the leadership, uh, because of the direction that they were able to provide to the, to the movement, uh, and because they were able to rise above, as I said, uh, you know, narrow considerations. So I would, I, would, I, would, I would interpret it as, as and look at it as a, as a very unique struggle uh, with very lofty aims uh, and a very successful one. But in what ways do you think that uh, we need to redefine our uh, notion and understanding of the nation, of the Indian nation today? Obviously, uh, there's, there's, there's a great deal of concern and despair yeah. about yeah. the very idea of the Indian yeah. nation. Well, I think uh, some sort of a redefinition has to be attempted. Uh, but more importantly, uh, and this is, this is a point that, that you would appreci appreciate more because of your interactions with, with contemporary politicians, uh, more importantly, what you need today is a rearrangement uh, that must take place, a rearrangement in which the states would have a major part in major decision-making processes. Uh, a rearrangement in which 
federalism or the idea of fed federal polity, which is so clearly uh, enunciated in the Constitution, is actually translated into practice. A rearrangement of financial, financial. I mean, that is really what it, it's all about. One can, one can indulge in a theoretical discussion of these questions, but in real, tangible terms, this is what it amounts to. And once you work out these arrangements, you would begin to look at many of these questions from that very perspective. And I, as I said, that we now, given the nature of our polity, and given the emergence of regional, par regional parties, uh, and they're having acquired, more importantly, the legitimacy which they, they did, which they did not have in the 60s or even in the, in the 70s, this rearrangement can be worked out much more effectively than ever before. Dr. Hassan, in the sort of devolution of, of uh, power from the states that you recommend, how exactly would you position and place the relationship of the minorities uh, that's a, the restructuring? You know, that's a very important question. But I think, uh, I mean, again, if you go back to the specifics of this whole uh, of this subject, then one cannot really talk in terms of a minority experience because the minority experience, ex we can talk of minority experiences just as you cannot talk of a Muslim community. One has to, I think, uh, come to terms with the fact, though somewhat belatedly, that one should talk of Muslim communities rather than just a Muslim community. Uh, and from that flows the, the argument that the experiences, historical as well as contemporary of these communities, and I'm really talking about, I'm not talking about other minorities, are very, very different. So if you think in terms of a formula that would, as it were, solve the problems of the minorities in this kind of arrangement, then you're going to land up with a whole lot of difficulties. So I think what we, we need today more than ever before is to really look at the specifics and see what are the areas in which minorities need support, say in Kerala or in Karnataka, in Bengal, in UP. And you will discover that their needs and their requirements and their aspirations and their problems or their grievances are very different elsewhere. I think we have, we have been thinking in terms of these monolithic ideas because we tend to, to, uh, to look at our society uh, thanks to the uh, the enumerators of the British census in very monolithic terms. Uh, uh, so I think that is something which we must abandon and look at specific issues in their specific, in, in, their, in their specificity. And in that context, I think it should be quite easy to, to see, to place the minority, to locate the minorities in this kind of administrative, bureaucratic, or political arrangements that we are talking about. Where might the impetus uh, for change and transformation come from, uh, given that you know, the governments increasingly seem to reflect the prejudices and, 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 and sort of limitations uh, perceived as though they might be of, of, of the community? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, uh, to get back to the earlier point that, that there is no way in which you can you can equate nationalism uh, with majoritarianism because that would uh, be inconsistent with the spirit of the constitution with the with the kind of trajectory that india has plotted for for 50 years uh, but that's out and it is obviously very it's a very difficult and a very massive task that any government will have to undertake but again if you uh, if you look at the experience in some of the states and not take the experience of the Indo-Gangetic belt, uh, UP, Bihar, and so on are, are, are exceptional for historical reasons. We won't go into all that. But if you look at the experiences in other states, such as Andhra or Karnataka, these arrangements have been worked out. And they're working out quite well, or Kerala for that matter. I mean, although there is you know, a rise of communalism and there, there are prejudices of all sorts, but in the existing uh, political and administrative structures, and I'd like to underline that, in the existing administrative and political structures, 
the minorities have been able to uh, to find a place. There is sort of an equation in 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 certainly in, in, in the Western media and in the Western mind between Islamic uh, fundamentalism and, and Islam per se. And I think some of that is, 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 exists in, in, in our own country. Uh, what kind of initiatives are, is, is, is the Muslim community engaging in uh, to sort of dispel, dispel this kind of confusion, shall I call it? Well, I don't, I don't think that needs to be dispelled necessarily. I think uh, if you were asking me that if there are Islamic fundamentalist movements, I would say yes, of course they are. Uh, 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 but if you, um, but I would also make the point that these movements are not as strong as they are supposed to be. Uh, that there are different kinds of ideologies that are uh, that have their appeal uh, in different areas uh, uh, amongst Muslims. But I think the important thing is that in the, uh, uh, and that is in the context of the Babri Masjid incident, and that is not something which people have really talked about, is the fact that there is a lot of soul searching uh, amongst Muslims. Uh, and, and I really can't claim to be speaking on behalf of large numbers of Muslims, but the Muslims that I have met and I have spoken to, and I've spoken to large numbers of them, addressed them, lot, lots of meetings here and there. There is a lot of soul searching that has taken place since 1992. And people are beginning to, to raise certain questions about the nature of the arrangements that they have to work out with different groups in Indian society. And these questions are very different from the ones that were probably asked in the 50s or in the 60s. There is also a recognition of the fact that uh, Muslim leadership per se has let them down, that it has, uh, it has plotted a wrong trajectory, that it has, not, it has not really emphasized the right sorts of issues, issues of education, reforms, and, 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 and so on, and, 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 and gender equality, and, uh, and that they have unnecessarily uh, mounted campaigns on issues which do not really reflect the, uh, the long-term interests of the, of the Muslim communities. And I think this is, this is a very important process. Uh, and I think this process itself would, in the ultimate analysis, uh, 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 undermine, uh, if not completely erode, uh, the credibility of the fundamentalist ideology. Dr. Mushir Hassan, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.